You are the eternal optimist. I'm, I'm the, yes, we can, I'm, man. I'm the yes, we can. I think too many young people who question whether voting, whether politics is worth it. Well, Um, partly because they have been told, the message is sent every day that government doesn't work. There's really no structure to market government, right? Right. The average young person knows far more about the cereal they're eating and the car they're driving than they do about what government actually does for them because they don't have marketing budget. There isn't a jingle. (laughs) The only time they know about what government's doing is is when when it's not doing it. doesn't work, right. So we're getting a good lesson in that right now. Hello, everybody. I am Michelle Obama, and this is the Michelle Obama Podcast. You're listening to my very first episode. I want to start by giving you all a little background on what it is I hope to do with this podcast. And I thought I'd begin by taking you through the journey that brought me here today. It starts back when our family left the White House. For eight years, my life was full of crazy schedules, juggling, big initiatives, speeches, state dinners, not to mention trying to raise two daughters and just keep my head above water. But once Barack's second term ended, the presidency was over. I finally had some time to breathe. So for a few months, the first year really, I spent a lot of time thinking, uh, talking with friends and family, really just being, if you know what I mean. I reflected back on my time in the White House, of course, but I went even deeper. I look back on the whole arc of my life. In this first season, you'll be hearing me talk with some of the people I'm closest with. My mom, my brother, friends, colleagues. And I wanted to start at the most basic level. In these episodes, we'll be discussing the relationships that make us who we are. Sometimes that might be as personal as our relationship with ourselves or how we navigate our health and our bodies at various points in our lives. In other episodes, we'll be talking about what the challenges and joys of being a parent are or a spouse, the growth we gain from leaning on colleagues and mentors, the friends who help us sort through the toughest times. What I love about these conversations is that they're topics and issues that we are all dealing with, no matter what's going on, whether that's a pandemic or a nationwide reckoning with race or just any old summer afternoon sitting with our own thoughts. And that's truly true of the topic for our first episode that can take some time to figure out And that's our relationship to our communities and to our country. Sometimes this relationship might be a source of fulfillment or meaning or joy. Other times, it might provoke questions that we don't quite know the answer to. What we're really talking about is our place in this world, how we feel about it, and what we can do with the power we have. I asked a special someone to join me for this conversation because he's navigated these questions throughout the course of his entire life. Well, welcome to my podcast. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Just in case you don't recognize that voice, that is my husband, Barack Obama. It's Uh, me. It is you. It is you. Like most Americans, we've been spending a lot of time together in quarantine. You don't seem to be happy about that the way she said it, right? <laughs> it's just a fact. <laughs> there wasn't a judgment. We've been together. I've been, I've been loving it. Yeah, yeah. I've been having a great time. But we've had some interesting conversations um, because these are some crazy times. Right. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about sort of how do our views about community, how do those shape who we are and shape our choices and shape our reactions? Um, So I thought we'd start with looking at how 
we've been shaped by our communities growing up. Our backgrounds are pretty different, you know, just in terms of the structure of our upbringing. That Absolutely. I, that I grew up with, as you call it, the... Leave it to Beaver. The, the, the black, the black, leave, it to the black leave it to Beavers. <laughs> with a, you know, family of four, father at home. The only thing missing was a dog. A dog, Cause, no. Because... <laughs> Marion wouldn't let you get a dog. I know. She and, feels bad about it now. And and now I got revenge. I've got two of them. You do. And I'd have more if it weren't for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I grew up with that family four. Um, Classic you know, nuclear family exactly. unit. And you grew up a little bit differently. I Things were a little crazy on my side. <laughs> well, I don't know if it was crazy, but it was different. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, I, you know, I was raised uh, mostly by a single mom. And my grandparents until we then moved to Indonesia Mm -hmm. and I had a stepfather and then Maya, my sister was born uh, and then I moved back to Hawaii and lived with my grandparents for high school. It wasn't the classic nuclear family. It was a tight knit family. The, the, The thing that maybe we did share was my mom and grandparents were similar to your parents in really prioritizing kids Mm -hmm. and thinking that you had to make sacrifices for kids. Uh, And so we felt loved Mm -hmm. and supported. And that's obviously where a community starts. Mm -hmm. One of the things we've talked about a lot is that one way or another, they didn't have to do it completely alone. There was a a neighborhood or a community or extended uh, family, extended families, structures around that helped families raise their kids in a loving environment and they didn't feel as isolated. A lot of the way uh, families ran before recently was an economic necessity. You know, my parents were poor, you know, and you're living on the second floor, living on the second floor of my great aunt's house, because that was a way to save money so that my parents, my mother could stay home. And, you know, my mom was able to work in the on, on the PTA at our public school because she and a couple of other mothers who could afford to stay home stayed home and they kept their eye on everybody in the school. Right. So there, there was an opportunity for because we saved money and we lived small, as my father said, there were parents who could be in the schools and who could be going on field trips knowing that there were plenty of single mothers or mothers who couldn't stay home. So moms like mine were looking out for all the kids at Bryn Mawr Elementary School. My dad's city job paid for everything we did. Yes. And it was, and that's not true today. Couldn't happen. It couldn't happen. Because of you know, the higher costs of, of health care, the higher costs of if you want to send your kid to college. Mm-hmm. So you've got financial pressures on the family. You then have all these institutions that used to be support systems shrinking. So more and more people start thinking in terms of uh, me. me. And and I do things on my own. Mm -hmm. I pursue a career. I make money. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm successful enough... I can be self-sufficient and my family can be self-sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, of course, the challenge is that that kind of setup creates this huge separation between people, mm-hmm. between uh, economic levels. Mm-hmm. Uh, you always had separation, unfortunately, around race. Right. But uh, now you've got separation within race. Right. Um, yeah, talk about that because cause, yeah. cause you... One of the things that happens in your neighborhood is it's not just white folks who mm-hmm. move out uh, over time. Right. It's also black folks who have means. Yeah. They just they start saying, well, we want the same we thing. We want to that- go out to the suburbs. Right. Um, you know, we saw that, too. I mean, I write in my book about white flight. Right. 
But the truth is, later on down the line, in the 80s or so, as black folks earned more money and got professions, the dream was to move to the suburbs. Right. That was the dream of middle class black folks, too. But why did, I also. Why, why did your, why did your uh, parents not think <laughs> about that? You know, my parents were uniquely stubborn about the suburbs. You know, they really, number one, my father never wanted to be house poor. Right. Right. So we, there were times when they talked about buying a home. Right. And I remember going to look at some homes and being excited that, ooh, I'm going to have my own room. Or maybe I have, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, uh, obsessed with having stairs in your house <laughs> <laughs> along with a station wagon because I was filled with that. I said, maybe we're going to have an upstairs and I can have some stairs. Well, I distinctly remember that. But I also, so you want stairs and a station wagon? I wanted some stairs and a station wagon. Because that, now that's some success. That's some success right there. Um, that's some uh, cleaver success. <laughs> you know, um, did the Cleavers have stairs? Everybody had they stairs. They must have some stairs. The Brady Bunch had yeah, stairs. The Partridge family. <laughs> Only people who didn't have stairs <laughs> were the Jeffersons <laughs> and the Evans family. <laughs> and, and and the Robinsons. So and the Robinsons. I thought, you know, I want some stairs. But we, my parents looked and my dad crunched the numbers and he said, you know, if I'm putting all my money into a mortgage then we're not going to be able to go on vacation. I'm not going to be able to save for your college. Right. And who cares about stairs? And, you know, we grew up in the city and this is just fine. And you need to learn how to live in the city. So, and, and my, my father was suspicious of the suburbs because they still weren't completely welcoming. Right. You know, we had had incidents of going into the suburbs of Park Forest that were all white. And I write about the incident where somebody scratched my father's car because we were black folks in a mm. neighborhood. Right. Um, so I think they probably felt a level of safety and security staying in a neighborhood that was surrounded by our extended family, as right. I said earlier. Well, one of the things when I moved to, to Chicago and I started as a community organizer and I was basically working in the neighborhoods that you grew up in. You were there. And I remember when I went to start my job, the guy who was training me, he said, the first month, all I want you to do is just talk to people. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would go around the neighborhoods and just talk to people about how they had ended up in Chicago, folks coming up you know, from the South and the Great Migration, their parents, grandparents. And, and people would reminisce and they would say, you know, when we first moved here, everybody raised everybody's kids. Mm -hmm. and that that was a really common theme. People would yeah. say, if I was messing up, mm -hmm. it wasn't Miss Smith down the street. She'd see me messing up. Mm -hmm. She'd scold me. Yeah. Then when I got home, I might get whooped because mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Miss Smith would have called my mom. How dare you have Miss Smith calling me <laughs> and telling me that you were on her grass and she, and then you said, and you had the nerve to talk back a exactly. boy. <laughs> boy. <laughs> right. So, mm -hmm. so what you got was this portrait of a village. Yeah. Things are just, it, it felt easier in right. those times to, have a family unit because it wasn't just that you were supposed to branch out that success was defined by your ability to leave your nuclear unit and make it on your own mm -hmm. that wasn't how either one of us was raised right. every elder lived with someone they shared expenses they shared households they shared the duties of raising kids so there wasn't this feeling that you were supposed to do this thing call loving and supporting your family on your own. Right. You know, that seems to be kind of a new thing. And so it felt like the, the, the community, the neighborhood that I grew up with operated on that notion. And it wasn't just up to that parent to provide that stability and that love. Your values always start with those closest to you, right? So my mom deeply believed in everybody being worthy of 
love and praise and support. I think part of what also happened because I moved around a lot as a kid and I didn't have a big extended family like you did was my friendships became really important. You know, all my buddies who you still know, you mm-hmm. know, Bobby and Greg and mm-hmm. Mike and all the guys I, I, I grew up with and, and have stayed in touch with all these years, that, that was my crew, that was my family. It's interesting when I look back, all of us were from broken homes. Mm-hmm. All of us were working class to middle class, at least from an income perspective, but we were going to a school that had a lot of rich kids. We had to share and improvise, right? Like, so Greg, you know, he lived on one side of town. The school where we went was a lot closer to my grandparents' apartment. So he'd sleep at either my place or uh, Mike Ramos's place mm-hmm. uh, most of the week. <laughs> and my grandparents fed him, fed him and, mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, my grandma's uh, mom looked after him and made sure he, his clothes were clean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, his dad was working hard. Uh, Greg's dad was a hardworking guy. But the point is, is that to some degree, we built our own community. You know, at the core of everything you have done politically, what I know about you as a person, and one of the reasons why I fell in love with you is... It was just my looks. Yeah, but you're that's cute, okay. but you know, no. But one of the one of the reasons I fell in love with you is because you're guided by the principle that we are each other's brothers and sisters keepers, and that's how I was raised. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, my values in terms of what I think my obligation, my my personal obligation, Michelle Obama, is that it is not enough that I succeed on my own. I have to care about what happens to the kid in the desk next to me at school because he's just as smart, but his mom works. And Mm -hmm. my father always taught us to take in everybody's full story, not to judge people, the drunk uncle or the the cousin out of work because you didn't know what happened to them, you know, that we weren't special. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you know, if something good happens to you or if you have an advantage, you don't hoard it. You share it. You you reach out. You give back. Right. And I can say that my family, my neighborhood, my notions of community growing up shaped that view and shaped the choices that I made in life as I felt your experiences shaped yours. I think I figured out once I got to school that if I'm just chasing after my own success, mm-hmm. that somehow I'm going to end up alone yeah. and unhappy. And that's why I ended up going into community organizing and the work that I was doing. Because when I thought about how did I want to spend my life, what I looked at was those civil rights workers had done and the freedom writers had done. And I thought, you know... That that looks like hard work, but it never looks like lonely work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that yeah. that looks like hard yeah. and and risky work, but it never looks like selfish, m- isolated. selfish, isolated, meaningless work. Yeah. Here you were. You, you you could have done anything because of your academic achievement, because you were the number one student at Harvard Law Review, the first black president of the Harvard Law Review number one, top of your class. Yeah, see, that's why you started dating me. You thought I was going to I was, no, I was, I I was going to get a meal ticket. I didn't know all that. <laughs> you didn't know I was going to Yeah, yeah go I didn't know you were going to be like, what? Broke. Uh... It's like, you you were running away from the money. I was like, what is wrong with this Negro? Yeah. Um, so, the, but, but, the, <laughs> but the thing that the Harvard education gave me, the, the real ticket that I punched wasn't, the chance to chase as much money as I wanted. What I purchased was enough credentials and security that I could go do the crazy things I wanted to do in terms of working in neighborhoods, going into politics, all that, knowing that Mm -hmm. I had enough of a floor beneath me that that I was going to be okay. And our paths were almost flipped because I was... Punching the ticket. Yeah, you you were you that know? sob driving. I was like, that was what I thought. It's like, get out of school, buy a nice car, 
you know. Remember the um, wine club? Remember that? You, I you joined. Are, you yes. Were, you were a wine Mem- club member. And, and we didn't even drink wine back no, then. I don't know how good that wine is what, either. Yeah, we, I, I, I never opened skeptical. a bottle. I just joined the wine club. It seemed like the very, you know, professional thing to yeah, do. Yeah, I, I, I think I teased you uh, a little bit on that one. Oh, definitely, definitely. But um, the Saab did have uh, heated seats. Oh, you though. love the Saab. Don't act like, especially Cause, cause coming from that, <laughs> that yellow car with the hole time, in I the was, bottom. I was, yeah, I was, I was like, no, we are not taking your car, my brother. I we was, are taking the Saab. I was, I was still driving those thousand dollar, five hundred dollar cars. But I. And I say this to young people, why did I leave corporate law and go into community service? The truth is it was selfish. I was happier. When I left that firm and started working in the city and getting out into the broader community of Chicago and seeing the interconnectedness of these neighborhoods, but but being alive in the dirt and the grit of helping people, I never looked back. Yeah, you know, you're exactly right. I always used to say the the years I spent organizing, I got more out of it than mm-hmm. than the people I was supposedly really. We were young. We didn't because we nothing. were so young and inexperienced. <laughs> we were stumbling around trying to figure we can fix it. It's like no, we can't. We don't know anything. Right. The uh, so you know, it's not like I set the world on fire, mm-hmm. but I I felt. Okay, this I feel like I've got roots here. I've got yeah. I've got a community. I've got people who I whose stories I know, who know me, who who connect me to a larger vision and a larger purpose. And one of the things that that uh, happened as a community organizer in Chicago is there are all these different neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. I know you felt that same way when you started doing public allies, right? Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about how seeing all these different mm-hmm. neighborhoods in Chicago and these young people yeah. um, gave you sort of a better sense of, oh, my community is mm-hmm. not just the yeah. South Side. My yeah. community is all these communities. When I left the firm, I went to the city and I got really interesting insight and exposure of what it's like to work in the government. But then I had an opportunity to run the Chicago office of this new nonprofit that was basically designed to help young adults, 18 to 30, find careers in public service. I had to literally go into all, almost all 77 community areas that make up the city of Chicago and meet with the heads of alternative school programs or you know programs working with single mothers or healthcare initiatives or federally qualified health centers. I learned so much about the nonprofit world, but more importantly, I got out into this big, broad, amazing city that was Chicago. Because when you grow up in Chicago, as you know- You don't leave the neighborhood. You do not leave the neighborhood. Some kids never had ever been from, left the west side to even go to the south side. There were kids who had never seen the lake, right. Lake Michigan. There were kids who had never been downtown before. Right. That was not an unusual thing mm-hmm. um, because of racism, because of segregation, because of gangs, because of a whole host of things. Um, so I was one of those kids. I saw more of the city because I went to a magnet high school right. and had to, <laughs> had to take the bus, take an hour-long bus ride. So right. at least I knew downtown. Right. But I had never been spent much time yeah, would, on the you, north you side. Go into Pilsen, Pilsen or, Little Village, which is predominantly Latino community with all Devon this culture. Street with it's an entire know, Indian American community. It, it's, it's like you walk down those streets. And, it's just a whole new world. Yeah. And they were all alive and b- vibrant right. with good people right. trying to affect their neighborhoods right. and caring Polish, deeply about Polish, the kids. Uh, neighborhoods up in Chicago. It's Second, just. Second largest outside of Warsaw is more and more Polish folks in in Chicago. And for the first time, I felt like a true Chicagoan. I felt the we of Chicago. Exactly. And that was by far one of the best parts of my career development was working with that nonprofit organization and meeting kids from all over the city and watching them discover each other and to discover different parts of the community and start to find their power and their voice. I mean, and the- start to find their common stories, right? Yeah, yeah. In the late 70s, early 80s, and, and I am a little bit older than you, although I look so much older than you. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> Good one. Yeah. <laughs> Point scored. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But but I but I think when we were coming up, the culture it wasn't beaten you over the head every day with what you should have. Mm-hmm. So I mean you you mm-hmm. yeah no you, I would you, joke you, about you went, the you went back yeah. to the my grandparents' apartment right oh yeah and yeah. it looked like my our apartment it wasn't any know? bigger than really was, the place you guys right. stayed. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel poor in that exactly. We didn't feel feel poor either. Um, right. But you go back to visit the house we grew up in. It's and tiny. You think, oh my God, we were broke. <laughs> we were we were broke. But yeah, we talk about this a lot. It's like you just the, the the phrase that sticks with me from my parents is never enough, never enough. Because the minute you <laughs> you you had a little bit of something, uh-huh. you know, you had a pint ice cream and a chocolate and you asked for strawberry, you right. get in trouble. It's like, how dare you not be satisfied with what you have? Right. And and then I we would feel bad because you think you're right. Why here I am with all this with this little bowl of ice cream <laughs> and I'm asking for more. Yes. You know? And that was before you even finished with before the, you even finished. You haven't even finished your ice cream yet. Like, you're never thinking. never satisfied. <laughs> never satisfied. And I find myself saying that to Malia and Sasha. Know. That's the biggest thing that gets on my nerves. They know it. It's like we're doing something great. And you start looking over you, at the you other. You start to look and it's like, to see what else is satisfied, next. satisfied, you right. know. Stuff doesn't make you happy. Yes. Um, so, so this is <laughs> so this is where I was going to take it. Mm-hmm. I think that culturally we become much more focused on stuff and much less focused on relationships, family, mm-hmm. and part of being an adult, mm-hmm. part of being a citizen is. You give something up. So instead of that, we have, you can have it all. You know, that's that's the philosophy. Um, you know, even when I talk to young mothers, it's how do I have it all, you know, um, or young families? Because the motto has become not that you sacrifice, but you should be able to have it all. Um, and how do you get it? And if you're not getting it, then something's wrong. And I always joke, it's like, that was the opposite of how we were brought up. You were never supposed to have it all, you know. You you were. Ne- In fact, if you had it all, you were being greedy, right. <laughs> because if you had it all, that meant somebody didn't have anything. Right. But that's what we're kind of teaching young people. You should, you should, you know, have a career. You should earn a lot of money. You should be fulfilled. You should have your passion. You shouldn't have to sacrifice that much. Um, you should have it all. You now have this this sense of, of kind of a cutthroat competition. We're all we're all on our own. That we're all on our it's own. Doggy dog. And it's doggy dog. It's not us. It's us against them. Right. Um, and and we are constantly nervous about where we're going to be on this pecking order. On this pecking order. And 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 that then reflects itself in our politics, right? Yeah. Because at a certain point. You know, I am going to start uh, thinking about politics in terms of how do I protect me, yeah. not how do I Help look after us. People. Look, the good news is that I think everybody's feeling this this uncertainty, this anxiety, this this sense that what we've been doing isn't working the way it should, and. Now I think you have this big contest of competing ideas. On on one side is those who argue that the problem is just them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so there's nothing wrong with chasing after as much money as you can get and not investing in public goods. Yeah. And because when the problem is them... You don't really have to change. You don't have to change. All you have to do is to stop them from taking your stuff. Mm-hmm. And and that is one route that I think our, our society and our politics could take. And then there's another story that says, you know what? Let's go ahead and re-embrace those values that made everybody better off 
back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, except this time let's do it in a way that genuinely includes everybody. To me, that's the better story. If you go back to that basic insight and just widen it, Mm -hmm. take the blinders of racism and sexism and homophobia and all those things off and say, there's really, Mm -hmm. our tribe is, is everybody. Yeah. And how, how beautiful and, 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 and yes. safe and stabilizing that it feels be. when we all have each other to lean on. Yes. That we that we don't have to hold this Take big gigantic by, thing by ourselves. Up by ourselves. When everybody was looking out for everybody, then the the whole was greater than the sum of its yes. parts right everybody gets a little bit more kids have more role models mm-hmm. even if their family's not doing as well mm-hmm. because there are people with some clout in these neighborhoods everybody benefits everybody from benefits that piece from of clout. their mm-hmm. ability to advocate yeah. to make sure that resources are coming in that whole process of lifting all boats comes about because this network of relationships in a community. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that when you look at all these young people who've been out there protesting in the wake of the George Floyd murder, that's their instinct. Mm -hmm. It's not uniform and it could Mm -hmm. still go both ways in this country. Uh, Just like it's teetering one way or the other in countries all around the world. Mm -hmm. This is not unique to the United States. It's just we've got our own version of it. How do we live together in a world that is shrinking and we are no longer just living in our individual neighborhoods? It's -hmm. it's, if Remember you were talking about Chicago? Yeah. Well, now everybody is on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And you can't just feel secure in your own neighborhood. Either you're going to war with the other neighborhoods or you start seeing that the people in the other neighborhoods are just like you and not as scary. Mm -hmm. And so let's see how we can put this whole thing together. I think that's how young people are, that's their instinct. The only thing that worries me, and I agree in terms of the hope that I feel when I look at young people, just how they were raised, the values, their exposure, the questions that they have, the change in the economy that's forcing them to ask a certain set of questions. That gives me hope. But the thing that I worry is that I hear I think too many young people who question whether voting, whether politics is worth it. Well, Um, partly because they have been told the message is sent every day that government doesn't work. You know, they take for granted all the things that, a working government has done in the past. And in in some ways we're still living Mm -hmm. on the investment that was made by that greatest generation. I always joke that, you know, and I said this about, um, you know, one of the challenges of being president is like, you don't have a marketing budget, you know, there's really no structure to market government. Right. Right. The average young person knows far more about the cereal they're eating and the car they're driving than they do about what government actually yeah. does for them because they don't have a marketing budget. The there isn't a time, jingle. You know? <laughs> the only time they know about what government's doing is, is when, it's when it not doesn't doing work. It. Right. So we're so, getting a good lesson in that right now. Exactly. If people are paying attention and they understand what's missing. Right. Not having a you know, a public health system. Uh, that takes care of people whether you're working or not, Um, that takes care of you whether you have pre-existing conditions or not, Um, unemployment, um, Social Security, you know, all of the things that sort of keep people going when the chosen path doesn't work. And and, and I think (laughs) you're absolutely right that the danger for this generation is that they become too deeply cynical in government, not understanding that all government is, is us collectively making decisions together. Mm -hmm. That community we talked about. That community that we talked about. Well, and and we've talked about this. This is how we raise this generation. 
we gave just, lip service to it. Yeah. Well, we didn't complete the we we didn't complete the cycle of the message, right? right. I, you know, I think more people in our generation raised our kids to be more open minded and to be more thoughtful and considerate. We we had the words for it, right? Yeah. You know, when it comes to fathers raising their girls. Right. I do think that the average father today does believe that their girl can be anything she wants to be. And they're delivering those messages around the dinner table. Right. And, you know, there's a different way of parenting. But what we didn't do, we delivered the messages at the dinner table, but we didn't take them to the boardroom. Mm -hmm. We didn't change our workplaces. We didn't change things outside. We didn't home. institutionalize. We didn't institutionalize the values changes. that we've right. been teaching this generation of right. kids. So now they're growing up. They're leaving the dinner table and they're going out into the world and going, the world doesn't look like what I was taught back at home, right. you know, and this isn't right. Young people are idealistic as they've ever been. I think more idealistic now than they were when I was growing up. The difference though is that that idealism they feel as if they can channel it outside of governmental structures and, and outside of uh, politics. The problem is, again, we're getting a pretty good lesson in this right now, there's some things we just can't do by ourselves mm -hmm. or even uh, groups of us can't do by ourselves. As a general proposition, we can't build infrastructure by ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can't deal with a pandemic we, by ourselves. We can't effectively educate the public by ourselves yes. through individual schools, through, yes. you know. There, there, you, there are just certain things, things that, that you have to do collectively because they're too big. Mm -hmm. They're too expensive. At the end of the day, I think that people are going to be... You think uh, they're going to do the right thing? I think folks are going to do the you right thing. You think they're going to vote? You, you know, I, you know me. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just... You are the eternal optimist. I'm, I'm the... I'm You're the, the yes, you eat. yes, we can I'm man. The, I'm, I'm the yes, we can man. <laughs> I am the audacity of hope man. Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, What's the alternative? What, that's the thing. And that's the As point. cynical as I can be in this, in the end, I... I agree. We we don't have an alternative. I think where we disagree <laughs> is usually you just think things have to get super, super bad before folks figure stuff out. Well, I hope we're and at I, that I'm point. always thinking, no, you know what, maybe we can learn a little we, bit. Before we crash before into we, the sun. Yes. We're getting close. <laughs> Will Robinson, pull out. And it's like, nah, it's not hot enough. Yeah. Um, Will Robinson. See, now that's, that's, a, that's reference a reference that... Uh, our Anybody older under 50 will, know will not. Lost in space. That's okay. Not, That's okay. Will not recognize. But I, I, I uh, tend to agree. You know, when in doubt, rely on hope. Might because, as well. well, you, as you pointed out, as, as a former president who reads and knows history, let's just take a moment to pause and think about that. Um, but as that person, you understand the arc of progress. We are, we are moving toward more inclusivity, yes. more openness, more we-ness. It's, 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 it's not an easy trajectory. It's in fits and starts. It is bumpy and it is uncomfortable. You know, uh, and that's how change happens. It's, it's not just one continuous arc. Right. It's up and down. It's cyclical. Exactly. One of the things that I want to encourage as we come to a, a close, a close um, because I know you're a busy man, mm. <clears throat> but I want to, first of all, thank you for um, <laughs> <laughs> what, like you had a choice. Right, exactly. <laughs> what are you talking about? Come on now. But, sure. it, but it's been fun to share um, some like of the conversations talking. that we have around the dinner table. Yes, sometimes our dinners get a little heavy. Um, part of what I hope that listeners will take away is from this conversation. It's not that we have the answers, but these kind of conversations need to happen around our dinner tables and in our smaller communities for us to just sort of understand and to appreciate the importance that community plays on who we are and that we can't do this stuff and we're not supposed to do this stuff. We weren't built to do this thing called life in a vacuum. Right. 
it is much more hopeful. It is much more gratifying, much more effective to live this life as a we. And I think as young people listen to this, as they're starting to shape their past, I would really strongly encourage them to think about building lives that are selfless, not because just because it's the right thing to do, but it truly is the better way to live. Um, It's more fun. It's more fun. It's more fun and, and it it comes back. And, and look, I, I know that this podcast is, is focused on a bunch of different kinds of relationships that we all rely on. And maybe one thing everybody can take away from this podcast relative to the other shows and other guests you're going to have on is just that you can't isolate the healthy friendships, marriages, parenting that goes on from the communities that they're in. Mm-hmm. So, so all these relationships are are valuable by themselves, but they thrive, they they prosper when the whole society is reinforcing these relationships. When you and I think about what's the inheritance we'd like to leave Malia and Sasha, more than anything, what it would be is that they're living in a country that respects everybody and looks after everybody, mm-hmm. celebrates and sees everybody. Because we know that if we're not around, mm-hmm. but those girls are in a society like, like that, that, they'll be fine. Yeah. Right? That's absolutely right. Okay. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, you, you, you could. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Appreciate you. More conversations to come. I'm so looking forward to all the other podcasts <laughs> and wisdom that will be doled out. Love you. Love you. Well, I would like to thank my wonderful husband, Barack, for joining me today on this inaugural episode of the Michelle Obama podcast. 